Hello and welcome everyone to the Cyverse webinar series. I'm Tina Lee, Cyverse's User Engagement Officer. Today's webinar features Joel Parker of Dr. Bonnie LaFleur's lab, who will be explaining their Clustuner app for benchmarking single cell RNA-seq experiments. For information on Cyverse webinars and to see listings of our past webinars, please bookmark our webinars page at www.cyverse.org webinars. As many of you may know, Cyverse is moving towards a diversified funding model supported in part by subscriptions to our platform. These webinars remain an important part of our mission, which is to deploy a national computational research infrastructure for life sciences, for data-driven discovery, and workforce building by researchers and educators. We're gonna take care of some housekeeping and then we'll get on to Joel's presentation. Uh, today's webinar is about 30 minutes long with time at the end for your questions. Please open your Zoom chat window and write your questions there for Joel to answer after his presentation. All of our webinars are recorded and I'll post this video recording on our website webinar page shortly, meaning hopefully within 24 hours. We now have more than 65 webinars organized into, gosh, about 15 playlists on science, technology, and Cyverse platform topics to help you learn and do your science at your own pace. And now I am pleased to introduce Joel Parker. Joel is a PhD candidate in biostatistics at the University of Arizona and helps to build statistical pipelines in Dr. LaFleur's lab. His research interests include Bayesian modeling, single cell RNA-seq data, and non-parametric modeling. Some of you may have attended Joel's webinar last season where he demonstrated the Shun Piker app, a Python-based pipeline for single-cell RNA-seq analyses, and that is also on our genomics webinars playlist. So, so pleased to host you again, Joel. Welcome. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Tina. And yeah, we're actually going to be talking about that Shun Piker app a little bit in this uh, in this webinar and how how these two these benchmarking and that pipeline kind of relate, uh, but really we're talking about a broad thing today, and that's benchmarking and single cell RNA sequencing pipelines. Uh, but first, I want to say I'm really happy to be here, and, and thank you for, for everyone for coming to the, the webinar. And uh, like Tina said, I'm a second year biostatistics PhD student, and uh, I'm working on statistical methods for single cell data. Now, I'm part of the DARE work group, and DARE stands for Data and Analytic Research Environment Working Group. And I specifically am working under the supervision of Dr. Zhao Zhao Sun, and Dr. Bonnie LaFleur. So I'm excited to present some of our work regarding the benchmarking metrics and single cell RNA sequencing pipelines. And I'll also be presenting our Clustuner app. Uh, wait, well, it's actually a package, a Clustuner package, which utilizes the metrics that we'll discuss today to help tune clustering algorithms, user-defined user parameters. But before I get into that, I'm gonna first introduce our group, and I'm also gonna introduce why the Cyverse platform is so useful to our mission. So our DARE work group, which I already mentioned, but I'll say it again, it stands for Data and Analytic Research Environment Working Group. And together, we work under the supervision of Dr. Bonnie LaFleur. And our mission can be summed up with three major directives. The first one is to develop user-friendly computing and analysis environment to facilitate cross-collaborative research. And we have showed examples of this with our Shumpiker Guide to Single Cell RNA Sequencing Data Analysis which takes you through an entire single cell RNA sequencing workflow. And we demonstrated this uh, earlier this year in a, a Cyverse webinar, which was mentioned earlier. Now, the second directive that we work under is to support externally funded research that might have highly multivariate and complex data integration. So in other words, our group can help provide statistical help uh, that have to challenging problems that may need expert advice. And the third directive is to develop novel methods for analysis, computing, and gain prominence and demonstrate expertise both nationally and internationally. And we're going to show this uh, an example of this today regarding the development of our Clustuner package for benchmarking single cell RNA sequencing pipelines. So the cyber cyber infrastructure helps us with our mission by providing solutions to challenging problems that we face in large scale computational science while also providing a user-friendly web-based interface. Cyverse has made it possible for researchers worldwide to attempt problems that were previously impossible due to computational constraints. And with the Cyverse 
Um, with the cyber discovery environment, researchers can utilize storage uh, for their data. And researchers like myself have access to a large amount of community data, community data to test their methods on. Now, analyses are done in Cybers utilizing their Cybers apps. So currently, there's hundreds of open source apps to help you analyze data in Cybers. And if you'd like to make updates to these apps and you're familiar with Docker, it's straightforward to change these apps or upload your custom apps for the analysis that you're trying to complete. Now, the apps never change, which makes it easy to reproduce any analysis that's completed in the app. But one of my favorite things about Cybers is the community atmosphere that they've helped to create. They host webinars like this one, and they provide opportunities for their researchers to grow. Also, when I first started learning how to create these apps in Cybers, I was able to use their chat support, and I chatted with a live person, and we came to a solution in a very minimal amount of time for the problem that I was facing. For the reason that I just mentioned, I believe Cybers is an excellent place to perform single cell data analysis and why our DARE workgroup uses Cybers to build our reproducible pipelines. So a little bit more about our DARE workgroup. Uh, we work under the concept of team science. So team, si yeah, team science can be defined as a collaborative effort to address scientific challenges in a way that leverages both the strength and expertise of professionals in diverse fields. For multidisciplinary projects, documentation is essential to the success of the overall group. Now, for documentation, we use Gitbook. Now, if you're not familiar with Gitbook, it's just markdown language that uses a Git repository. And this Gitbook provides a central location uh, for you to go and find information on the various projects that we're working on. Uh, another essential aspect of what we do is reproducibility. Now, there are three types of reproducibility. There's data reproducibility, computational reproducibility, and statistical reproducibility. Now, for data reproducibility, we follow the FAIR guiding principles. Now, FAIR, F-A-I-R, stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. We're able to follow these principles with Cyverse through the data store, where we can secure large-scale data storage and retrieval. Now, we also have computational reproducibility through the use of RStudio, RShiny, and Jupyter Notebooks. And these can all be accessed to the Cyverse discovery environment. Cyverse also uses containerized workflows for their apps, which ensures computational reproducibility as well. Now, last but not least, there's statistical reproducibility. Now, this is done through the use of good statistical practice and also by providing availability to the source code with well-documented instructions. So now that I've introduced our group, the Cyverse infrastructure, let's dive into why we're here, and that's single cell RNA sequencing. Uh, so single cell RNA sequencing, if you're not familiar, is a next generation sequencing method that allows researchers to see transcriptomic profiles in thousands of cells. And this allows us to see tissue diversity as a resolution much higher than traditional bulk RNA sequencing. The end-to-end -end workflow starts by taking a sample of living cells. For example, this can come from a, a cancer tumor, or this can also come from a blood sample as well. Each cell in the sample is then isolated and captured using an encapsulation method. Then the encapsulated cell is assigned a unique barcode, allowing the transcripts to be mapped back to the encapsulated cell. Now, after cell isolation, sequencing technologies like SmartSeq2 or Chromium 10X are used to generate the VASQ files, which contain the raw reads. Now, in Cyverse, there's an app which utilizes the Cell Ranger software to read these VASQ files and generate the read count read count matrices used in the downstream analysis. So information about this app that uses the, um, that uses Cell Ranger can be found in our Gitbook documentation. So the read count matrices contain a number of times each gene appeared in each cell. So one of the main things that I'd like to point out about single cell RNA sequencing data is the number of zeros that appear in a data set. So a zero count can occur for two different reasons. The first one is a biological reason. That means the gene did not actually appear in the cell. And the second reason is a technical reason, meaning the gene does exist in the cell, but was unidentified due to some step in creating the data. And these issues lead to sparse data, which in turn has led to the development of many novel statistical methods 
explicitly used for single cell RNA sequencing. So once the read count matrices have been created, we can then begin to analyze the data for our specific hypothesis. So in this webinar, we're mainly gonna be focusing on workflows for clustering data. Now, there's been many pipelines created to analyze single cell RNA sequencing data. And some of these examples you may have even heard of. One is a uh, CIRAT, which is a pipeline for those of us who like to use the R software. And there's also a uh, SCAMP, uh, which is for those people who uh, like to use Python. I also use Python as well and, and R, but both of these uh, pipelines are, are very similar. Uh, as you know, both of these pipelines will take you through very similar journeys because they most of them start with the count data. And then after you have the count data, you move to some pre-processing, normalization, quality control step. Then after those steps, uh, you're going to do some sort of dimensionality reduction. And then finally, the lower dimensional embeddings are used to perform clustering. Are used as input, sorry, the, the lower dimensional embeddings are used as input for the clustering algorithms. So for many experiments, uh, this clustering step is one of the most desirable things about single cell RNA sequencing. For many people who are unfamiliar with these methods, going from the raw count data to the clustering results can feel a bit like magic. And as devoted science, scientists, this can be a, a very uneasy feeling. So for the remainder of this talk, I'm gonna focus on this clustering part of the pipeline and I'll be discussing benchmarking metrics that can be used to help us define the best settings for our models for our specific data. All of these methods discussed can be easily implemented with our Clust Tuner package, which is soon going to be available to the public. So throughout this talk, I'm gonna be talking about benchmarking and tuning user-defined parameters. Now, depending on who you talk to, people might have very different definitions of what these two things actually mean. So I'm gonna define them in terms of the context that I'm gonna be using them today. So first, uh, a user-defined parameter is a parameter in an algorithm that can be changed by the user that can have dramatic effects on the overall results of the algorithm. So when trying to select user-defined parameters, we're gonna use some form of benchmarking. And when we're talking about benchmarking, we're talking about metrics to help us to, to select smart user-defined parameters. Or benchmarking metrics can be used for new method development as ways for testing individual elements of an algorithm distinct from the whole. So to give an example of this, uh, during the course of a single cell analysis, a researcher makes many decisions about how the data should be analyzed. And having good benchmarking metrics can help us define the impact of different decisions on the overall results of the experiment. So we could use benchmarking metrics to help us select user-defined parameters. So we give examples of these kinds of user-defined parameters in our Shumpiker Guide to Single Cell Analysis Pipeline. We point out where the user-defined parameters must be carefully selected to optimize results. In the Shumpiker app, we're using phenograph clustering and we must carefully select the number of K nearest neighbors in the algorithm, uh, which can have major effects in the number of clusters determined. I'm not gonna go into too much detail here about this specific case, but more information can be found on our Shunpiker app on Cybers. So now you've heard me mention clustering uh, quite a bit. So if you're not familiar with this area of research, you may be wondering to yourself, uh, what even is clustering or why do we use clustering? So researchers often use unsupervised clustering methods to unbiasedly identify cell subpopulations based off of gene expression. Now, if you're not familiar with the term unsupervised clustering, we're referring to methods that group the cells together with similar gene expression without knowing any information about the true cell types. So there are methods like fact sorting which can sort the cells prior to sequencing, uh, but these methods require prior knowledge, which can, make, which can make it challenging to discover new cell types. And utilizing unsupervised clustering methods with single cell RNA sequencing data has led to the detection of many novel cell types. And since we're able to identify cell types based off of clustering, we can then tease out the rare cell types that often go undetected by previous methods. However, 
One of the major challenges with clustering is knowing which clustering algorithms to use. For researchers who haven't been spent much time with unsupervised learning algorithms, it can be a bit overwhelming the number of methods that there are to choose from. And not only do we have to choose an algorithm, but each algorithm has user-defined parameters that can be tuned. And these parameters can dramatically change the results of a clustering algorithm. So naturally, we start to think to yourselves, well, I'm just going to do some research and I'm going to choose the best algorithm that there is. So I'm going to go ahead and save you the Google search to tell you that there isn't one singular best algorithm. And the clustering algorithm that you should use and the values that you should select for the user divided parameters are going to depend on your specific experiment. So then the next question we might ask is, well, how do I compare different algorithms and different algorithm settings with each other? to determine the best method for my specific experiment. And this question is really at the heart of what we're discussing today. So I wanna give a, a motivating example for why we should care about these user-defined parameters and just show how big of a difference that it makes. So here we're looking at an example with two different cell types. To keep it general, we can say this is a major and a minor cell type. Now you can see in this example, it'd be really hard to visually inspect and tell where the distinct clusters are if we didn't have any, if we didn't have any knowledge of the true cell types. So suppose we want to use unsupervised clustering to try to figure out where these cell types are. Uh, and we decided to use the algorithm with uh, and just use the default parameters. You can see that when we use the default parameters of this specific algorithm, these clustering results do not resemble the underlying gown truth. So you might tell yourself, okay, there's way too many clusters here and we can see that. Um, so you might go back and change, change the user defined parameters until you get something that looks correct. However, when we do this, we begin to introduce bias into the analysis and we don't wanna introduce bias into the analysis. Instead, we can use benchmarking metrics to help us unbiasedly compare the results from different user-defined parameters to select the best overall parameter. Now you can see that when we do this, the, uh, the, the, the clustering results the, that, the, that the clustering method picked up, the, the clusters, look a lot more like the underlying ground truth. So to demonstrate the importance of using user-defined parameter, uh, of, of tuning user-defined parameters, and to really drive the message home, we're going to use the mouse atlas data uh, to sh show the importance of these benchmarking metrics. Now this data consists of 20 mouse organs. Uh, each data set has a different number of cell types, and the researchers use fact sorting to obtain the true cell types from this population. Now, I remember saying that we don't actually need the true cell types for an unsupervised algorithms, and that's still the case. However, when we do methods development type research, we often need the underlying ground truth to ensure our optimization is capturing what we intend to capture. Once we're confident in our method works, we're no longer going to need this underlying ground truth. Now, the cluster package focuses on utilizing metrics uh, that utilizing benchmarking metrics that can be used for tuning clustering algorithms in a very general case. These metrics can also be used to compare uh, results from different algorithms as well. However, for this demonstration, we're going to be using the CRAT pipeline to cluster cell types together. The clustering method in this pipeline requires a resolution user-defined parameter and can take any value greater than zero. So in this plot, we can see the relationship between the resolution user-defined parameter and the number of clusters. The number of possible clusters detected in this algorithm can range from two all the way to 16 for the same data set. So you can see this can have dramatic effects on the downstream analysis for the overall results of the study. In the next few slides, I'm going, to be, uh, I'm going to be demonstrating metrics that are used to help define the best user-defined parameters for our experiment. All these metrics discussed today are easily implemented with our clustering package. Again, unfortunately, the clustering package is not available to the public, but it will be soon. So all these metrics that I'm discussing today have very general definitions and can be applied to any type of unsupervised clustering results. 
However, I'm going to be talking about these metrics as they relate to single cell RNA data. So the average silhouette score is a very popular method for tuning, benchmarking, uh, for tuning and benchmarking metrics. This metric is calculated for each cell and can range from negative one to one. It measures how similar each cell is to the cells in its cluster relative to how similar it is to the cells of other clusters. For this metric, higher scores are better, where one represents the cell is perfectly clustered, zero represents a cell that may lie on the decision boundary, and uh, any, any measure that's less than one uh, may be a cell that, that's mislabeled. This is useful because we can visually inspect the clustering results for each individual cell and see which cells may be mislabeled. So in this example, using the default parameters in CIRAT, there are several cells that may be mislabeled. However, for our purposes, we want to determine the overall quality of the clustering results. And to do this, we could simply take the average of all of the silhouette scores, where we want a higher average silhouette score uh, for the overall clustering algorithm. So once we can do that, we can test the results from multiple resolution parameters using these average silhouette scores and choose the resolution that maximizes the average silhouette score. This is going to have a dramatic improvement on the plot that we see in this slide. The next thing I'm going to discuss, the next metric that I'm going to discuss is the kalinsky harabaz index. This measure is also known as the variance ratio criterion, and it measures the between cluster variance and compares it to the within cluster variance between cells. This metric can take values greater than zero and we wanna choose a user-defined parameter that maximizes the kalinsky harabaz index. This is a plot that can be generated directly from our cluster package. And what we can see is that the value of the kalinsky harabaz at different resolution-defined hyperparameters. We can use this plot to see which resolution maximizes the kalinsky harabaz index and choose the resolution to get our final results. Again, or sorry, again, in this example, we're discussing the CIRET pipeline, but these methods and these benchmarking metrics can be generalized to any unsupervised clustering results. The last metric that I'm going to talk about today is the Davies Bolden index. This metric is defined as the average similarity measure of each cluster to its most similar cluster. Since we want the clusters to represent distinct cell types, we want this metric to be minimized. So here, we're looking at the same tissue as we were in the last side. If we choose the resolution that minimizes the Davies-Bolden index, then the kalinsky harabaz index and the Davies-Bolden index agree on the best resolution for this data. Now, I do want to mention that we found that this is the case many times, where the Davies-Bolden index, the kalinsky harabaz index, and the average silhouette score they often agreed on the best user-defined parameter for our data set. When dealing with the CRET pipeline specifically, if these metrics don't agree, then we just averaged the resolution parameter of their suggested um, resolution parameter. And we, we, we just, so we averaged the resolutions between them. Um, so we call this a, a mixed metric decisions where we're looking at multiple benchmarking metrics. So I think if there's one singular takeaway from this webinar, it should be that the default parameters of clustering algorithms are not optimal and can significantly harm our results. We clustered the cells from the 20 different mouse organs in the mouse atlas. Therefore, there was 20 different experiments uh, for us to cluster. And for each data set, we tuned the CRAT clustering algorithm utilizing the metrics discussed in this webinar and compared the results to the true underlying cell types via the adjusted RAND index. If you're not familiar with the adjusted RAND index, it's just a measure from 0, 01 to compare the adjusted accuracy of the clustering results to the true underlying cell types. As you can see, the metrics discussed today had similar results across the 20 different mouse organs. But the main thing that we're looking at here is that all of the metrics discussed today when used for tuning user-defined parameters did significantly better than just using the default parameters. So in summary, single cell RNA sequencing is a powerful technology that can allow researchers to classify cell types together based off of gene expression. 
Benchmarking metrics provide a reference to see how changes in our analysis affect the overall results. For example, we could try different clustering methods and see which one works best for our experiment. Benchmarking metrics can also be used to help select user-defined parameters in clustering algorithms. So last but not least, the clustering package can quickly calculate benchmarking metrics for any analysis involving the clustering step. Uh, now, again, the clustering package is not quite available to the public. We're waiting to uh, publish this method. Uh, but once we get out in preput, we'll, we will be releasing it to the public. So for future directions, our team is developing novel approaches to tackle challenging problems in computational and analytical problems in this field. Our cutting edge research includes multi-omics data integration and spatial transcript omics data analysis. So at this point, I have kind of wrapped up everything that I want to talk about today, and I, I believe we still have time for, uh, for questions. Absolutely, we uh, have time for questions. Um, I don't see any in the chat, so I don't know if that means that people are just kind of processing what you need or whether or what you've uh, spoken about today or whether that um, they might be thinking about how to how to ask frame a question yeah. to you. My question would be, do you anticipate that Clust Tuner would be something you would put in like a Docker container along with your pipeline? Or how exactly would that work? Um, so so I think I think the I think any pipeline mm -hmm. uh, for sync for any kind of that's gonna do any clustering step. Um, you should use the I mean, I'm gonna say the cluster package, yes, because we because you know I'm I, we, we it, it uses these uh, metrics that are have been well tested and well used outside of single cell RNA sequencing. So they're they're good metrics, they're solid metrics. Um, but in general, you need to have some sort of benchmarking so that you can see how how things change as mm -hmm. decisions that you're making throughout the pipeline change. Got it. We want to be able to to actually have a, a measure for this, and that's what benchmarking metrics do. Good. So I, I believe in our pipelines, yes, uh, it, it will be integrated into any pipeline that we create. Um, involving clustering. Okay. Um, there are some questions, so let me read them into the into the video. Could Absolutely. you explain a bit more the interpretation of the RAND index? Yeah, so uh, the RAND index actually has a, a, a very nice uh, interpretation. It's really, you could think about it as accuracy, uh, which is just the proportion of, of cluster. So you're comparing it to the true cluster labels. And the RAND index is basically looking at the percentage that you got correct. Um, however, one of the issues with the RAND index is that there's this there's this element of randomness that you can kind of get lucky by by guessing if if, if you have like a few cell types. So the adjusted RAND index um, attempts to correct for this. So oftentimes you'll see. Um, in papers that they use the adjusted RAND index instead of the RAND index. Um, but yeah, I hope that answers the question. But yeah, it's really just a measure to compare how how similar uh, the, the labels are that the unsupervised clustering algorithm gives to the true underlying cell types. OK, thank you. Um, somebody would like to understand if this methodology is similar to the correction for batch effect. Your, your clustering app? Uh, no, it's it's different. Um, so we're not, we're not, it's not, uh, so batch correction is you're, you're looking at basically multiple different, um, when, when, when the sequencing was done at different, different times. And you're gonna see like, if you were to do a principal component analysis that the variation, that there's more variation due to the timing of when the sequencing occurred rather than um, actual biological variation. So with batch correction, what you're trying to do is correct for that. Where the benchmarking is more looking at once we have that batch corrected data, 
or an example of where we can use benchmark. Once we have this final analysis data set, and we're we have we're making these decisions about how to to how to how to analyze this data. So another example. So we 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 spoke a lot today about tuning uh, metrics and how changing a tuning metric changes the results. And then the results are run through a, a benchmarking metric, and you can see how those are changing uh, by how these metrics are changing. But another example is like, what is the impact of using five principal components in the analysis compared to 50 principal components in the analysis? You can run both of those, run the clustering algorithm, and then look at the changes in the benchmarking metrics. And that'll give you a measure of how those changes are affecting the results. Okay. I hope that answers the question. Okay, maybe there will be a follow-up. Um, one more question. Someone was wondering if you have evaluated ClusTuner on T cell clustering. Um, I mean, in general, it's it's. Uh, do you have any So for T cell clustering. I mean, that's a very specific use case. I mean, benchmarking is is very broad in terms of if you if you want to see the results. So for T cell clustering, I mean, are people able to unmute themselves? Yes, they should be. Um, so whoever asked the question, if you want to follow up with that, um, I that was uh, my question. Yeah. 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 yeah so I think what I was trying to get at is um, so in some clustering cases we have pretty distinct cell types. And in others, we have cell types that are more of like an activity state, but it looks a little bit more continuous. Yeah, um, so it's, it's almost like a, compare like a cell those. subtype type of situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we've talked about this in our lab quite a bit. And I think it I think it gets really challenging to, to if you're gonna look at something that has a lot of cell subtypes, I think it gets really challenging to look at them in the context of in the same analysis with types that are very different. Because what, you, what you'll see is you'll see like the T cells will all be clustered close together and a benchmarking metric might not be able to tease that out very well. But if you were to zoom in and just look at those T cells and you're just looking at the variation within those T cells and then those can separate clusters and look at like the, the subtypes, they're kind of like a hierarchical model and then use the benchmarking metric that way. It should work. Okay, that great. Makes, Thanks a lot. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. yeah that does make sense. Okay. Thanks. Cool. Great. Thank you. Um, somebody asked, do you have guidance for choosing a reference to infer cell types? Can you apply these same tuning techniques to find the best reference? Uh, I think, I think so the, the benchmarking metrics is really, is really, I think finding the best reference is is more of a biological problem, not statistical. Uh, not yeah. stati not statistical. I I don't think that you could. I mean, maybe maybe you could, but what what these benchmarking metrics are doing is really helping you find the best separation of the clusters, and but what those clusters actually are or what those represent. Um, there's there's other methods. For that. Okay, and here's one from a beginner just like myself. This person says, I have never performed a single cell RNA seq and I'm very new to the technique. The goal of my experiments is to look at what receptors are co expressed in individual neurons. Is it necessary to benchmark all single cell RNA seq data? I think so. So, so you might not use these specific benchmarks. So, these benchmarks are for specifically the clustering step, which is what is mostly, which is, you know, a big step in single cell RNA sequencing, but you might have different benchmarks for different analyses, if that makes sense. Benchmarking is important um, because especially in single cell data, there's so many, there's so many decisions that have to be made going from the raw data to the, whatever your final step is. And you're going to want to look for benchmarking metrics that are going to give you reassurance that you're actually capturing what you intend to capture. Um, 
so, so yeah, I think I, th I think benchmarking is is really important just in the broad sense of any when you're doing any kind of statistical development. Okay, thanks. Yeah, no problem. Great. Okay, um, if there are no more questions, we'll end the webinar. Um, just want to thank you again, Joel, and uh, and your DARE team for, for sharing your expertise and how to understand uh, selecting parameters can affect single cell RNA seq results. I think that's just really basic about the methodology, right? Yes. Um, and please join us next month for the final webinar of our season. Uh, the topic is a surprise, even to me. So <laughs> we'll see. We'll get it posted up on our webinars page. And until then, take care, everyone. We'll see you back online uh, in a month or so. All right. Thanks, awesome. everybody. I really Thank appreciate you, it. Thank you, everybody. Right. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye now.